Hello and welcome to Walk the Talk. I am Shekhar Gupta, talking to you from this very lonely and silent looking corridor in Delhi University's South Campus, in fact in its biotech center. But just next to these corridors, in these little labs, there are scientists whose minds are humming with excitement and they are causing some excitement also in our public debate. And our guest today, uh, a team of famous five, famous six, but one is missing today, <laughs> famous five today, and famous five monsters, and you are the chief monster. Oh my God. <laughs> Dr. Deepak Pentel, welcome to Bok the Talk. Chief monster because uh, you are working on Frankenstein foods, <laughs> although you make an unlikely Frankenstein. Well, that's all the things are being put by some people, but uh, it's a pleasure to see you here. In the Wonderful in the to see you, sir. Lab, yeah. And you know, uh, congratulations on the great work you've done because your new mustard uh, has now passed most of its safety test, your GM, GM mustard, uh, if I may say, uh, and, it's, and it, it's set to revolutionize India's oil seed farming. Well, we, we have a feeling of little relief that after working for so many years, you know, it is coming to some kind of logical end. So let's hope that everything will go well and uh, it will be released for, in, for commercial purposes. And it's taken more than 30 years, sir? Almost 30 years, yeah, almost 30 years. Because it started first in 84, I think. 84, I returned from abroad. Yes. And around 86, 87, we started in earnest working with uh, oilseed mustard when we found out that, you know, Indian gene pool lines and East European gene pool lines, when you cross them, there is hybrid vigor. So there is yield increase. How to, how to capture it has been the struggle all these years. So why didn't you just make a hybrid out of them like for wheat, rice, so many hybrids now? No, in all these crops to make hybrids, because uh, flowers have both male and female part and they tend to self-pollinate. So if you want to make it's a hybrid... Herbaphrodite we call it. If you want to make a hybrid, you will have to make one of the lines male sterile so that the pollen is... Otherwise, is uh, it, it pollinates itself. Itself. And right. then you have a self variety, right. which is also in wheat and rice, they are grown by the farmers. But hybrids yield better right. than... So hybrid means something else has to pollinate it. That's right. right. That's right. And uh, so that was the problem. That even when you got uh, from East Europe and you... When we got the clue that East European into Indian will give us more yield, but uh, th there was this big question of how to control the pollination right. in the plant. So right. all this GM or GE business, I like to call it genetically G engineered right. because all crops are genetically modified, you know. Uh, from the time 10,000 years back when the crops were first domesticated, you won't be able to recognize what the crops looked like at that then. time and what it look, they look today. So genetic modification has been a continuous process, accelerated by modern plant breeding after 1900. But GE, genetic engineering, is a little bit more... Uh, punchful technique because you can take genes from any source and put it into a, into a crop plant. But uh, Dr. Pentel, that's what scares people. <coughs> Put a, taking a gene from here and putting it there, I don't know what will happen. I will eat, maybe I will grow horns <laughs> or I will grow a wagging tail. Uh, yeah, no, this, this is an issue. But uh, you know, the genetically engineered crops are out there from almost 1996 onwards right. and millions of hectares have been planted with these crops and trillions of meals have and been eaten trillions of meals have been uh, eaten as has been pointed out by many authors and nothing wrong has gone so as long as we make sure that the protein we are introducing does not have allergenicity or toxicity which is easy to find believe you me Scientific analytical techniques have improved tremendously over the right. last couple of years. Analytical techniques, so wonderful analytical techniques are available that one millionth molecule you can, dilution you can figure it out. So with using all these technologies, we can ascertain now whether there is any toxic or allergenic effect. 99.999% proteins are not either allergenic or toxic. Right. Very few proteins. In fact, metabolites, small molecules are much more toxic. Proteins are very rarely toxic. Right. So, so these fears, you would say, are misplaced. 
Absolutely. And this is only leading us to a situation where we are not able to make great breakthroughs in agriculture. You know, 170 million hectares of land, we should reduce it. Very marginal lands should be taken out for other uses. Right. And you need intensification in areas property. where property. So we are, we are actually using too much land and too many people to produce too little crops. Absolutely. Our yields are much lower. That's of course, even at global level, we are not performing. Much lower than China also. Absolutely. In China, China's productivity is almost two to three times more than us in all the crops. Right. Because they have worked more intensively in plant breeding than we have. And of course, now you know they are buying up big biotech companies. I believe they're, like uh, they're buying up Syngenta, Syngenta, which is next only to Monsanto. Monsanto and Bayer in terms of their yes, annual yes. revenue. Uh, I think Bayer is negotiating with Monsanto if I see yeah, the That's, all, papers, that's yeah. right. To so there's a huge amount of consolidation going. So sir, how does it work? Chinese have bought over Syngenta, why? Because they want the technologies. I see. They want the germplasm and the technologies. In fact, uh, their research is pretty good and I was myself very surprised why they are uh, buying up a company like Syngenta. But uh, I think they are being audacious and uh, thinking about the future. So they are buying Syngenta when we are driving out Monsanto. <laughs> 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 well, because China is China and I, India is India. If we need technologies for our farmers, I don't think we should be driving out anybody. If the technology is useful to the farming communities, increases their incomes, leads to better uh, incomes for the country also, I think then we should very seriously look at what is available. And you speak purely as somebody who's dedicated his life to this science. In the public domain only. In public domain only. And with public funding. Public with funding. With no, commercial, no commercial interest, no, no commercial <laughs> funding all your life. No. And you know, uh, many people will not remember it, but you rose to be vice chancellor of Delhi University. You could have joined UPSC, you could have taken any sinecure, but you've come no, back to your lab. We, we like this work, you know. This is like your own baby and right. you have to nurture it and take it forward. But the ultimate aim would be to take it to the farmer's field. You right. know? That is very critical. Dr. Pentel, uh, before I bring you to describing uh, your baby so that idiots like us can understand, uh, will you say China is today far ahead of India in plant breeding and this research? The, in terms of publications, in terms of intensity, in terms of their genome sequencing work, yes, by, there is no doubt in my mind about that. Why were we left behind? We are not uh, investing so much. A little, uh, you know, we get dissipated, we dissipate our energies very quickly. You know, grandstanding a little bit. If you say something, I must say. Contradict it. Yeah. Contradict it for the heck of it. So, they are more focused, that's yeah. for sure. And where did we lose focus? Uh, was it because of uh, lack of funding? Was it because of activism? Was it because of lack of knowledge in the political class? I think after Green Revolution, we did not uh, follow up on developing indigenous know-how. We have good breeders, we have good agriculture scientists. In fact, I, <coughs> I featured some on Walk the Talk uh, from ICA, people who've done great work on rice. On Basmati, Basmati rice, rice, I yes. saw that show and it was great that you brought that work out in the public domain. Thank you, sir. Uh, because I believe they are among the best plant yes, breeders yes, in the world. Yes, yes, but they are not that many. <coughs> yes. I wish we had hundred of them. Right. But we may have only a dozen of them, right. you know, which is a very small number. Right. And so you have to group, nurture groups over a longer and period frankly, of time. And dog breeders will make a better living than plant breeders in this country. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, also the lure of taking up administrative positions right. and being a science bureaucrat uh, is much higher. Becoming a director. Uh, and then uh, working, on the, the working on the bench. And, uh, and you know, all great plant breeders, they work for 20 to 30 years on a crop in a, like a marathon runner, you know, you keep right. on pounding the road and moving ahead. Like uh, well, Dr. <laughs> we, Borlaug. We have tried. Dr. Borlaug, of course, is a great example. Uh, people think he developed dwarf wheat. His major contribution was rust resistance. Yes. And you because know, rust, it's, fun it's a fungus. Just imagine if that work would not have happened, we would right. have had great famines. in. Paxenia, uh, if, I, yeah. if I remember Paxenia. from my own botany yeah, yeah, that's classes. Right, yes. That's right. 
uh, and that used to lay a lot of Indian wheat low. Once it will come, you it know, it will just destroy uh, it. Yeah. So you pick genes from the wild sources, either by conventional breeding or now through genetic engineering. It is so important that we. But it means the same thing. I, I, the Implic net net effect is the same. Implication, Implication is, the same. is the same. Why this fear of GM? Why this Franken foods? Why this? <laughs> Part of it, I believe, I, I am not able to also fully comprehend it, but part of it, I believe, is that our relationship with health-related issues is much stronger. You know, we are born, these days, kids are, ch children are born mostly in a hospital, hospital, and longevity has increased so much that most of us will die also in a hospital. <laughs> in a hospital yes. <laughs> so, all through our life, we face health issues. And all of us are Google doctors now. Uh, Before the doctor finishes his prescription, you are reading on Google and saying this will have this but side effect. tell me how many are Googling on what are the diseases of crop plants. Right. And how we are going to stay ahead of them. So what you're saying is that we are very, uh, we are very knowledgeable about, about medicine, but not knowledgeable about food. Much more, much more sensitive to issues related to health because it affects us directly. Very little interest in food, how it is grown, uh, how all the plant breeding work has happened. You know, I consider the discovery of dwarf wheat and rice as the biggest jackpot that mankind hit in the last century. Absolutely. Just imagine if those yields would not have increased, whole of Asia and Africa, even Europe. Even would Europe. Have Europe is a big food importer now. Food importer, and they, they use these dwarf. Right. Uh, in fact, the U.S. also benefited from dwarf wheat. It's right. not only us, right. Right. but we would have been facing famines. They might not have faced famines.